Hello and welcome everyone. This is Mr. Podiger here with a special screencast-o-matic recording for the lesson on Unit 3, Lesson 3, on Egyptian pyramids, tombs, and greater Egyptian culture. <clears throat> for this particular recording, I'm essentially addressing your attention to listen, follow along, and answer the key concept questions that appear for these two separate readings. The private lives of pyramid builders, and of course the top 10 things you might find in a pharaoh's tomb. <clears throat> so you're welcome to please listen carefully, of course, as the content is conveyed to you through this way. Uh, instead of you having to uh, read it by yourself, here we go. So this is for the first part of the reading, uh, The Private Lives of Pyramid Builders. Just for clarity, just so you guys understand the part that I'm referencing, uh, this is for part three of the lesson. Of course, you can answer the key concept questions as they appear and replay any part of this presentation for later. I do believe as a separate recording, you will see the top 10 things you might find in a pharaoh's tomb uh, later on. Let's begin. So The Private Lives of Pyramid Builders. Pyramids tell us about the fabulous lives of great pharaohs, who died surrounded by symbols of wealth and privilege. But the story of the ordinary people who built them is less often told. Archaeologist Dr. Joyce Tiddlesey redresses the balance. Mystery builders. Who built the pyramids? And where did those builders live? Egyptologists used to suspect that Egypt's construction sites were supported by purpose-built villages. But there was no archaeological evidence for this until the end of the Victorian age. Then, in 1888, the theory was finally confirmed. When British archaeologist Flinders Petrie started his investigation into the Middle Kingdom pyramid complex of Sensorit II at Ilan, here are associated with a walled settlement, Cahoon yielded a complete town plan whose neat rows of mud brick terraced houses provided a wealth of papyri, pottery, tools, clothing, and children's toys, all the debris of day to day life that is usually missing from Egyptian sites. If we are to make sense of the Great Pyramid of Giza as a man made monument, this is precisely the sort of evidence that we need to uncover. But with so many splendid tombs on offer, few early Egyptologists were prepared to waste time looking for domestic architecture. It is only recently, thanks largely to the ongoing excavations of Egyptologists Mark Lenner and Zali Hawass, that excavation around the base of the Great Pyramid has started to reveal the stories of the pyramid builders there. Scale the Workforce The Greek historian Herodotus tells us that the Greek pyramid was built by 100,000 slaves who labored constantly and were relieved every three months by a fresh gang. He is, however, wrong. King Khufu, 4th dynasty ruler of Egypt, the royal responsible for commissioning the Great Pyramid, did not have a vast body of slaves at his disposal, and even if he had, there was no way that 100,000 people could work simultaneously on one pyramid. All archaeologists have uh, their own methods of calculating the number of workers employed at Giza, but most agree that the Great Pyramid was built by approximately 4,000 primary laborers, quarry workers, haulers, and masons. They would have been supported by 16 to 20,000 secondary workers, ramp builders, tool makers, mortar mixers, and those providing backup services such as supplying food, clothing, and fuel. This gives a total of 20 to 25,000, laboring for 20 years or more. The workers may be subdivided into a permanent workforce of some 5,000 salaried employees who live together with their families and dependents, and a well-established pyramid village. There would also have been up to 20,000 temporary workers who arrived to work three or four month shifts and who lived in a less sophisticated camp established alongside the Pyramid Village. The Pyramid Village. The sacred precincts of the Giza Pyramid Village Cemetery were defined by the Wall of the Crow, a massive limestone boundary which separated the land of the living from the land of the dead. The main Pyramid Village lay outside this wall, closed by the Valley Temple of the Great Pyramid. Unfortunately, this settlement now lies beneath the modern town of Nazlet, Nessa Saman, and is largely inaccessible. The Village Dead. Men, women, and children were buried in a sloping desert cemetery. Their varied tombs and graves, including miniature pyramids, step pyramids, and domed tombs, incorporate expensive stone elements borrowed from the king's building site. The larger, more sophisticated limestone tombs lie higher up the cemetery slope. Here we find the administrators involved in the building of the pyramid, plus those who furnished its supplies. Tomb robbers more or less ignored these workers' tombs, but their basic grave goods being of little interest to thieves in search of gold. Consequently, many skeletons have survived intact, allowing scientists to build up a profile of those who lived, worked, and died at Giza. Of the 600 or more bodies so far examined, roughly half are female, with children and babies making up to 23% of the total. Thus, we have confirmation that the permanent workers lived with their families in the shadow of the rising pyramid. Managing the task. The tombs of the supervisors include inscriptions relating to the organization and control of the workforce. These writings provide us with our only understanding of the pyramid building system. They confirm that they work, what, the work was organized along tried and tested lines, designed to reduce the vast workforce and their almost overwhelming tasks to manageable proportions. The splitting of task and workforce, combined with the use of temporary laborers, was a typical Egyptian answer to the logistical problem. Already, temple staff were split into five shifts or files. 
and subdivided into two divisions, which were each required to work one month in ten. Boat crews were always divided into left and right side gangs and then subdivided. The tombs in the Valley of the Kings were decorated following the system, also by left and right side gangs. At Giza, the workforce was divided into crews of approximately 2,000 and then subdivided into name gangs of 100,000. Graffiti show that the builders of the third Giza pyramid named themselves the Friends of the Mancure and the Drunkards of the Mancure. These gangs were divided into files of roughly 200 people. Finally, the files were split into divisions of maybe 20 workers who were allocated their own specific task and their own project leader. Thus, 20,000 could be separated into efficient, easily monitored units and a seemingly impossible project. The raising of a huge pyramid became an achievable ambition. As bureaucracy responded to the challenges of pyramid building, the builders took full advantage of the efficient administration which allowed them to summon workers, order supplies, and allocate tasks. It is no coincidence that the 4th dynasty shows the first flourishing of the heretic script, the cursive, simplified form of hieroglyphics that would henceforth be used in all non-monumental writings. The Temporary Workers The many thousands of manual laborers were housed in temporary camp inside, uh, beside the pyramid town. Here they received a subsistence wage in the form of rations. The standard old kingdom ration for labor was 10 loaves and a measure of beer. We can just about imagine a laboring family consuming 10 loaves in one day, but supervisors and those of higher status were entitled to hundreds of loaves and many jugs of beer a day. These were supplies which would not keep fresh for long, so we must assume that they were, at least in part, notional rations, which were actually paid in the form of other goods, or perhaps credits. In any case, the pyramid town, like all other Egyptian towns, would soon have developed its own economy as everyone traded unwanted rations for desirable goods or skills. The temporary laborers who died on the site were buried in the town cemetery along with the tools of their trade. As we might expect, their hurried graves were poor in comparison with those of the permanent workers who had a lifetime to prepare for burial at Giza. The Industrial Complex to the south of the pyramid town lay an industrial district, a gigantic cohesive complex divided into blocks or galleries separated by paved streets equipped with drains and including some workers' housing. Again, investigations are still in progress, but Mark Lanner has already discovered a copper processing plant, two bakeries with enough molds to make hundreds of bell-shaped loaves, and a fish processing unit complete with the fragile dusty remains of thousands of fish. This is food production on a truly massive scale. Although, as yet, Lanner has discovered neither storage facilities nor the warehouses. The animal bones recovered from this area and from the pyramid town include duck, the occasional sheep and pig, and most unexpectedly, choice cuts of prime beef. The ducks, sheep, and pigs could have been raised amidst the houses and workshops of the pyramid town, but cattle, an expensive luxury, must have been grazed in pasture. Probably the fertile pyramid estates in the delta. <coughs> and then transported lit lie for butchery at Giza. Excuse me. Who were the pyramid builders? This is one of the last sections right here. After comparing DNA samples taken from the workers' bones with samples taken from modern Egyptians, Dr. Muhammad Kamal at Cairo University Medical School has suggested that Khufu's pyramid was truly a nationwide project, with workers drawn to Giza from all over Egypt. She has discovered no trace of any alien race, human or intergalactic, as suggested in some more imaginative pyramid theories. Effectively, it seems the pyramid served on both as a gigantic training project and deliberately or not as a source of Egypt titanization. The workers who left their communities of maybe 50 or 100 people to live in a town of 15,000 or more strangers returned to the provinces with new skills, a wider outlook, and a renewed sense of national unity that bounced the loss of loyalty to local traditions. The use of shifts of workers spread the burden and brought about a thorough redistribution of the pharaoh's wealth in the form of rations. Almost every family in Egypt was either directly or indirectly involved in pyramid building. The pyramid laborers were clearly not slaves. They may have well been the unwilling victims of the koreve, or compulsory labor system, but the system that allowed for the fair to compel his people to work for three or four months shifts on state projects. If this is the case, we may imagine that we were selected at random from local registers. But in a complete reversal of the story of the oppression told by Herodotus, Lanner and Hawass have suggested that the laborers may have been volunteers. Zahi Hawass believes that the symbolism of the pyramid was already strong enough to encourage people to volunteer for the Supreme National Project. Mark Lanner has gone further, comparing pyramid buildings to the American Amish barn raising, which is done on a volunteer basis. He might equally well have compared it to the staffing of archaeological digs, which tend to be manned by enthusiastic, unpaid volunteers supervised by a few paid professionals. So as you guys can see, pyramid building is not just about, you know, the reason why the pyramid was built for a pharaoh. You know, it's really easy to think about the people at the top, right? The heroes, the, the pharaohs. And in this way, they do matter. Don't get me wrong. But when you take a deeper, closer look at the private lives of not only the builders, but the whole community set up to support the builders, that is history. And some would argue that that is the real history that often gets overlooked. 
So you guys should be able to answer those key concept questions there for that section for the lesson. Good luck, and remember, of course, you can replay any part of this presentation for clarity. Thank you.